Okay, so I want to um, continue on with um, the periodic table. Now we've talked about what is an ion um, versus a neutral atom. Neutral atom has no charge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What we're going over today theoretically should end today, uh, unit one, but it may trickle a little bit over into tomorrow. So basically, today is it for unit one. Unless it's not. <laughs> okay, so um, ions versus neutral charge. You definitely need to know this. An ion is when the number of protons and electrons are not the same. Hence, all ions, no exceptions, have charges. And the charge is, is indicated by the difference in charge between the protons and electrons. There are more electrons, it's going to be a negative charge. If there are more protons, it's going to be a positive charge. And a chart, um, like we filled out last time, uh, that worksheet, um, you'll have that on the test. You'll have an abbreviated version of it. Okay. So make sure you understand how to do those problems on the chart. In other words, if I gave you um, this ion has nine protons and 12 electrons, what's the charge? It'd be a negative three. And then you need to look up the number of protons on the periodic table. Now I'm gonna give you a periodic table for the test. Also, I'm giving you the um, conversion chart from lab two. You know, the one with the bull face, there's uh, infinite, um, and how, how many centimeters in an inch and that kind of stuff, okay? So those two sheets, you don't have to worry about. I will always give you a periodic table on every test, no exceptions. I will always give you um, formulas that I told you not to memorize. There are very few formulas in here that you have to know. Um, now, when you get to 1A or it's not 1A, or 2A, they, depending on who's teaching it, 1A requires more memory than this class. 1A requires more memory than 2A. Because 1A is the one that's got the most uh, challenging aspects to it. And you have to memorize more, it moves at a faster clip, and the problems are harder. Not a great combination, but that's Chem 1A. All right. Um, okay. So um, I may I ask you a question like copper metal. How many particles is in a copper? Metal. Now notice it's neutral. How many particles? I want to know. Now, what's the first thing you need to know about that? What do I mean by a particle? That's electron, proton, neutron. So how many particles are in copper? Well, we need to look at the periodic table, find copper, and copper is element 29. So first of all, how many protons are in copper? Twenty-nine protons. That's what the twenty-nine means. It's also the atomic number. How many electrons? 29, because it's neutral. Now, if you look on copper up there, for those of you who have good eyes, 63.55 is the atomic mass of all the isotopes. So I'm gonna say,
we're talking about the isotope copper 65. Okay, so how many neutrons does copper 65 have? Okay, 36 we got from 65 minus 29, 36. We add all these up, we have 18 and six, six. Assuming I did the math in my head accurately. So that's a question, how many particles? Now, if that was an ion, then the number of electrons is gonna change that somewhat. So how many particles does copper plus three have? Well, right away we know protons are 29, and this would be, let's do copper 65 again. So we've got 36 new neutrons. How many electrons does it have? I heard somebody say, 26. Okay, so that'd be three less particles, three less electrons. Neutrons are the same. Protons have to be the same because it's copper. Remember, the number of neutrons determines the elements, not neutrons or electrons, it's protons. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable doing these type problems for next week. Now we've already talked about um, we've already talked about the um, where is it? I forgot where I mentioned it. We've already talked about the um, oh here it is the four groups you need to know. You need to know the alkali metals the alkali earth metals, the halogens, and the noble gases. So columns one and two, columns seven and eight. Make sure you know those, because I'm going to ask them to give you a periodic table on the test, and you're going to have to identify on that test those four groups. Now, Further organization on the periodic table. There are three main groups how the elements are organized. Most of the elements in the periodic table are metals. So these are all metals. What's the opposite of a metal? <laughs> That's right, not a metal. So those are the non-metals. And there's a group of elements that are transitional between the metals and the non-metals.
And those are either side of that dark zigzag line, except for aluminum. So there's silicon, geranium, arsenic, tin, etc. So three main groups, metals, nonmetals, metalloids. Now metalloids are extremely important in our day-to-day -day life. 1947, Bell Labs, which is AT&T now, Bell Labs invented a transistor, 1947. Up until that time, we relied on vacuum tubes, which were really hot, they required a ton of power, and they were not very fast. The transistor was faster. It's slow by today's standards, but in those days, it was blindingly fast when it could do something. Secondly, they were small. They, were, they didn't require much power compared to a vacuum tube. And they didn't burn with a lot of heat. Vacuum tubes are like light bulbs, man. Put out a ton of heat. The first computer used vacuum tubes back at the end of World War II to calculate the trajectory of cannon shells from ships. It took up a room like this. It had like 30,000 vacuum tubes in it. And it required another room to supply the power for all those vacuum tubes. And that same room was air conditioning because the room got so blazingly hot. And the purpose of that, again, was just to do calculations to figure out, if I point the gun at 16 and a half degrees, with this much gunpowder, how far will it go and where will it go? That's all it did. And it was a huge breakthrough, big deal. Because before that, they did it all by hand with slide rules and little calculating machines that were horrendously um, simpleton. So transistors fixed a lot of that. Our cell phones are probably 10 or 20 million times more powerful than that first computer, if not more. Our cell phones have a ton of computing power, a ton, to do those nice videos and simulations and stuff. Requires a lot of computing power. So, um, and you can thank a metalloid for inventing transistors. So they're very important, very important. Okay, so you need to know how the periodic table is organized. So I'm basically gonna give you a periodic table. I'm gonna say, um, identify these, alkali earth, alkali earth metals, halogens, noble gases, metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Okay, let's look at the properties of metals versus non-metals. Who can give me a property of a metal? Solid, um, except for one thing. What's not solid at room temperature? That's a metal. Mercury, that's right. Non-metals are also 
solid, but they're also liquids and gases. All right. Tell me something else about metals. All Magnetism is a very interesting property. Some uh, metals are magnetic, some are not. It has to do with the way the electrons align. Because they pair up inside the atom. And electrons have a magnetic part to them. So if the magnetic electrons inside the element line up north, south, south, north, they cancel each other out. So if you've got a lot of them that are unpaired, it's magnetic. If they're not, it's not magnetic. So some are, some aren't. None of the nonmetals are magnetic. What? So hard, usually they say hardness as opposed to softness. Yeah. So so most are hard, except for mercury. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yes, that's a real important one. Okay. And then as far as non-metals go, um, it varies. Some are gases, liquids, solids. Okay, she mentioned um, uh, it was conductivity, right? Conduct electricity, non-metals. Don't. Yeah. Yeah, carbon's weird. We're, it's weird in a lot of ways. It doesn't form an ion. You know, it should form an ion, but it doesn't. It has four bonds instead of two. You know, all this stuff about carbon. Um, and carbon is a non-metal, but, you know, graphite is really hard graphene is harder you know so carbon's weird interesting okay conduct electricity good what else can we combine with yes um So can non-metals, though. A lot of um, our modern metals are alloys. They mix like steel versus iron. Steel, as you mix in like chromium and some other things in there to make it um, uh, stainless steel, for example. Um, uh, carbon into with iron makes steel, but it rusts. So if you throw in chromium, it doesn't rust. You know, I mean, so they mix them up a lot. In fact, that's the um, biggest area of um, world concern is when we make alloys for jet engines. Jet engines get really hot. We're talking thousands of degrees. And the metal cannot melt. So they, they have these very sophisticated alloys where they add rare earths in there. Very few countries have deposits of rare earths. China got the most in the entire world. And they they do them politically quite well because they own most of them. The United States has a fair amount. Also, rare earth chemists are not very common as well, except in China. So they really 
they really uh, take advantage of their uh, natural resources. Okay, so let's continue on here. What else? There's two more I want to talk about. This is a metal, right? How would you describe this? Okay, it's solid. Yeah. Shiny, exactly. Metals are shiny. Gold, think about silver, copper, they're all shiny. Nonmetals are dull. And there's one more. One more. Say again. So you're saying Yeah, that's a really interesting property. Um, I wasn't thinking of that. Um, trying to think. Mercury always messes things. Yeah. Um, because Mercury is a, a liquid at room temperature, everything doesn't apply to Mercury. Um, it is conductive, though. Um, that's true. She was talking about, you're talking about the um, kind of the organized way metals are. They're in like cubes or or whatever, some kind of geometric, three-dimensional shape. Um, let's see, how do you want to describe this? Um, Um, by the way, you guys, I've been doing this comparison for decades, and you guys come up with some very interesting ones that None of the other classes have come up with. <laughs> just just FYI, FYI, you guys. Okay, so one more. One more. Yeah. Yes. Um, you can say that about non-solids too. That's an interesting observation though. Uh, oxygen. Well, it's tied up. Well, what's dirt? I mean, um, in fact, 99.9% .9 of all metals are combined with oxygen. They're called oxides. Yeah, you don't get a typical metal by itself in nature. That's why gold is so rare. Silver, you just, you know, unless you're up at Sutter, Sutter's Mill, walking along the stream and go, oh, here's a big giant. I mean, literally, in the beginning, they were literally this big, the nuggets. You just pick them out of the water. It was that wild. Um, but normally it's tied up in an oxygen oxide. Then you've got to mill it to get to get the metal out. In fact, that was one of the biggest environmental issues up in Tacoma. They had a smelter where they were getting lead and copper out of out of ore from the ground, and that was creating this horrendous pollution issue. Um, so it's so yeah yeah. 
Yeah, some of the early iron metal came from asteroids, and they dug them up. Um, yeah, that's right. Possibly some bacteria too. <laughs> yeah. Um, both of them have high melting points. Um, rust is actually an oxide. Rust uh, is a ferric oxide, Fe2O3, um, which is another you know combination of oxygen. Um, do you ever see um, anything made out of, um, well, let's see. Let's go back to Roman times. What did the Romans eat out of? Hmm? Lead. Lead, that's right. They ate out of pewter. And pewter contains lead. They also drank water out of lead pipes. So if you were wealthy, you had a ton of lead in your system. If you were poor, you, you ate on earthenware, which is very healthy, and you ate very healthy foods as well. Peasant food is very healthy for you, especially for your um, um, micro, um, micro um, organisms in your gut. The wealthy did not eat peasant food, it was beneath them, and they ate very non-healthy, rich foods. Kind of like today, probably the same thing. All right, well, the, the, the property I was thinking of is something called ductile. And what that means is you can bend it and you can stretch it. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you're thinking, yeah. So metals you can bend and stretch. We had a lab in Olympic Community College up in Washington we did differentiating. So we had all these metals and non-metals out and we had an anvil in the lab and a big hammer. And you gotta take each example and put it on the anvil and smack it with this big hammer. And the metals just went and the non-metals shattered made a huge mess. So what ductile means is you can stretch it, you can bend it, you can compress it. Non-metals are not ductile. Now, these three stars are the classic definitions of metals versus non-metals. All the others are those very creative ideas you guys came up with which are true also, but it's really cool you guys came up with that. These three are the ones I want you to know though. These are the ones that uh, they're in your chapter. All right, conducting electricity is one of the most important of the three because guess what? The metalloids sometimes conduct electricity and sometimes don't. And that's where the transistor comes in. Is what you can do is you can apply a voltage to a metalloid, positive voltage, and it'll conduct electricity. You apply a negative voltage, it doesn't. So it's on or off. The name of that transistor is called a diode. Two forms, conductive, non-conductive. And the metalloids are sometimes metals, sometimes non-metals. So right here, are the metalloids sharing properties of both. And it depends on the electric charge placed upon them. Okay. Um, and here are the groups I want you to know. Okay. 
And we talked about this already, but I'm going to go over it again. Patterns and trends on the periodic table. Okay, pattern number one is ion formation. And I mentioned this before, I wanna talk about it again. Okay, so group one, the alkali metals plus one. And we talked about this. Now in group three, the only one that it applies to is aluminum. All the others are metalloids. So that plus three is for aluminum. Actually, um, okay. And the halogens are negative one. Oxygens are negative two. Nitrogens are negative three, and copper is in between the positive three and the negative three. So uh, carbon does nothing as far as ion formation. Also the noble gases don't form ions. So that's one pattern, ion formation. Another one is something, a big word, electronegativity. Okay, electronegativity. Okay, so electronegativity is a tendency for one atom to attract its neighbor's electrons. Hence the word electro in there. So higher the electronegativity, the more it wants to grab electrons from anywhere it can. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity, francium the smallest. So the trend is that way. So everything falls off from fluorine. Now this is a big deal because this determines polarity, this determines intermolecular force, this determines the kind of bond something will form based on its electronegativity. Okay, atomic size. Fluorine's the smallest. Francium, the biggest. Okay, so those are the two trends and patterns, three trends and patterns I want you to know about the periodic table. Okay, ion formation, electronegativity, and atomic size. Again, I'm going to give you a periodic table and then ask you questions about it.
All right, so that's chapter four. We jump over to chapter three now. I'm going to start introducing the concept of a chemical reaction. Now, if I start with 10 grams of something, and we have a chemical reaction, how many grams do I end up with? Most of the time, like 99.9% of the time. 10 grams to start with. 10 grams, that's right. That's called the conservation of mass. Now with the chemical equation, what you start with is called reactants. What you end with is called products. We have reactants, products. So that means Okay, so the mass of the reactants, what we're starting with on the left, it's always, reactants are always on the left, and the reaction proceeds from left to right. We end up with is products. Now the sum, this is the important part, the sum of the reactants is equal to the sum of the products. Because the reactants changes into products meaning they aren't the same molecule as what you started with. So this is kind of weird now. The sum of the reactants equals the sum of the products. The reactants are different than the products chemically. But if you put them on a scale, they're going to be equal. Because if they're not equal, we have a big explosion. Like we, like we had in 1945, it was the first big explosion because we lost some mass when the atomic, first atomic bomb went off in New Mexico. We lost mass because the reactants were not equal to the products. And good old Einstein came up with this cutesy equation that probably most of you have seen before, E is equal mc squared, where there's an interconversion between energy and mass. C, does anyone know it's, well, it tells you the speed of light. Speed of light is very fast and it's squared. So if we have a small difference in mass, because we multiply by C squared, the energy is huge. But mass and energy are interconvertible. Now, going back to the way atoms put together, we have two protons, both positively charged, sitting next to one another in a tiny, tiny, tiny space. There's a horrendous amount of energy required to keep them together instead of flying apart, because opposites, opposites repel. Excuse me, um, like charges repel. And that energy is what is being manifested in that equation there. E is equal to mc squared. But if we don't lose mass, then there's no interconversion. Okay, so conservation of mass. That's a law, okay? And it's, it's pretty good law, especially when you consider there's any differences, we use the E is equal to mc squared to make up that difference. Okay, let's look at a reaction. Okay, we have C4H10, which is butane. We're gonna take and burn that in an oxygen environment. I'm gonna end up, in, end up with carbon dioxide 
and water. The reactants are butane and oxygen products are carbon dioxide and water. But what, the mass of what you started with, 266 grams, is equal to if we weigh the, the carbon dioxide gas and the water gas, it'd also be 266 grams. Now, when you take a butane lighter and go click, 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 can you put your hand over that reaction? Well, you can, but what would happen? <laughs> Hurt like hell, right? Okay, so there's something going on there. There's some heat being given off. Okay, so the total energy in our reaction system there is equal to potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay, I want you to think of kinetic energy as the energy of motion. Potential energy is stored stored in chemical bonds. Okay, so we have potential energy and kinetic energy of reactants. We have potential energy and kinetic energy of products. So things are gonna change when that chemical reaction happens in terms of potential and kinetic energies. So when a energy happens, excuse me, when a reaction happens, bonds are broken. Remember, that's where the potential energy is stored. Bonds are broken. Bonds are broken on the butane, the carbon and hydrogens. Bonds are broken with the oxygen, the two oxygens. Pulled apart. And then things happen. And we, they're reformed on the other side carbon dioxide and water. So each side again has potential and kinetic energy. If the potential energy goes down when the bonds are reformed, we still have to have that same amount of energy. So it's manifested in kinetic energy. So let's call potential energy P Okay, so P plus K is equal to P plus K. P plus K reactants equals P plus K product. If P goes down, what must K do to make up? Got to go up, okay? So potential energy is going down. K has got to go up. Low potential energy is more stable than high potential energy. So this reaction now is going from high potential energy to low potential energy when the bonds are reformed. And the difference is given off in kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy I mentioned before is the energy of motion. So all atoms and molecules and subatomic particles move, okay? Kinetic energy, they're moving constantly. As we raise the temperature, the movement increases. As we lower the temperature, the movement gradually decreases until it doesn't move at all. 
That's the only time they're not moving is at absolute zero. So real quickly on kinetic energy now. So it's a measurement of movement, of motion of the atoms. Okay, and then an absolute zero, there's no movement. How do we measure movement of particles? What metric do we use? Huh? Temperature, exactly. Higher the temperature, higher the movement. So it's a measurement of mo movement or measurement of kinetic energy. Okay, so let's go back to our reaction of butane up here. Our potential energy is going down. It's being converted to kinetic energy. So if we have more kinetic energy than what we started with, can we put our hand over that reaction? Can't because that kinetic energy is increasing because our potential energy went down. Our kinetic energy went up and the measurement for kinetic energy is temperature. So the temperature went up. And if it goes up above about 140 or so, you're going to start to feel it being pretty hot. Get up in the 200s, you're going to have tissue damage. Okay, so we're just exchanging potential and kinetic energies from reactants to products. Okay, now that's really important to understand. Why does a chemistry... Why does a chemical reaction happen? One reason, stability reasons. The products have to be more stable than what you started with. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Or the potential energy in the bonds have to be lower than what you started with. But you've got to make up for it in terms of kinetic energy. And that's measured in temperature. So if I ask you on a test, What's temperature? The answer is it's a measurement of kinetic energy or measurement of movement. It is not energy. It's a measurement of energy. Now, Chapter three in your book goes through a very nice description of what I did from a different perspective. And it'd be good to read that as well. Okay. Now, if I say it's 72 degrees in here, what does that mean? Is that the same as 72 degrees Celsius? It's Fahrenheit. The world does not go on Fahrenheit except the United States and five other small, tiny, tiny countries, we go on Fahrenheit. The rest of the world goes on centigrade or Celsius. I drive up, up the coast to Canada or down the coast to everyone's the metric system, except us, thanks to Ronald Reagan. Okay, so there are Degrees in Fahrenheit, degrees in centigrade. And there's also an absolute temperature scale based on the Celsius temperature scale. That's called Kelvin or K. So a lot of books, including the one we use, has a ton of problems on converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And when we're in lab, we use Celsius. When we're outside of lab, we use Fahrenheit. And there's never a time when you need to convert from one to the other unless you're traveling a lot. So I don't spend a lot of time on this conversion. 
it's kind of a pain. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy to do. I mean, it's easy to do, but it's a, just a pain to do. However, there's one conversion that will be required to know in this class. That is going from C to K. So if we were at zero degrees Celsius, So at 100 degrees C, that's where water boils. At zero to C, zero degrees C, that's where water solidifies or makes ice. So that's 100 degrees spread. If we were to go below zero C, That's when we hit absolute zero. No atomic motion. Okay, so the difference between Celsius and Kelvin is 273. And in 1A, it's 273.15. And here it's 273. Now, all thermodynamics in science and engineering is done in absolute temperatures. all thermodynamics, things like um, colligative properties of metals, colligative properties of salts. The formulas all have T in their temperature, but it's Kelvin temperature. <laughs> so, So Kelvin is equal to 273 plus C. And the inverse of that function is C is equal to K minus 273. And again, there is a Equivalent absolute zero for Fahrenheit is called Rankine, R-A-N-K-I-N-E. Uh, engineers use it a lot. And they use Kelvin a lot as well. It depends on architects, for example, use Fahrenheit a lot when they're designing, you know, heating and air conditioning systems. They use Fahrenheit a lot. They also use centigrade a lot, but it's a mishmash. It's a mess. This is the one I want you to know for this class. Relationship between K and C. 273. And in your mind, I want you to burn this in. Kelvin is always higher than C. So your answer, if you're converting, make sure that make, your answer makes sense. Kelvin has got to be higher. And it's higher by 273. So how would I do that problem? Two, 342 degrees Kelvin is equal to how many degrees Celsius? Pre-calc math is required to do this problem. Sixty nine, because sixty nine plus two seventy three is three forty two. So you'll have a couple problems like this on the test. And I want you all to say thank you, Ferguson. This is an easy one, <laughs> but it's really important to know that um, 
the world works on centigrade or Celsius. The world scientifically, particularly in the thermodynamics and quantum world, works in Kelvin. Absolute. So at zero degrees Kelvin, what can you say about the molecular or atomic movement? Hmm? That's right, it doesn't move at all. Zero Kelvin means zero movement. By definition. Now, we are officially done for the unit one. So your test, now tomorrow we're starting unit two. We're gonna get into something called electronic configurations tomorrow, which is how each electron is organized within the, within the molecule. And there's, there's orbitals and what electrons are in what orbitals and all this stuff. Okay, so what we covered is dimensional analysis, significant figures. We've covered uh, relationships of the periodic table. We've been able to figure out number of electrons, neutrons, protons. What is a reaction? What are the forms of energy of that reaction? And how do we measure kinetic energy? So I posted past tests and um, it's under um, files, test related. Does it say old test? I forgot. It? Huh? It just says practice. practice test. My other class has said old test. <laughs> Same thing. So um, theoretically this, this test will cover one, two, three, and four but don't study chapter one. Because you've kind of covered chapter one throughout chapters three and four particularly. Okay, so there's gonna be a lot of dry lab number two in there. So dry lab number two is really good to study from. Make sure besides it being a lab you get graded on, it's a really good study aid for this test coming up. Okay, so, all right. So are there any questions about, now, test is gonna be in here. Tests are on Saturday, like I was saying before. Uh, the test should be about an hour and a half long. Um, if, if some of you need more time, we'll start lab later. Because we always have plenty of time in lab. I wanna make sure everyone's has adequate amount of time. A test run? No, you don't need a Scantron because I don't do multiple choice tests. No multiple choice tests, period. If there's an online test, I'm forced to use multiple choice, but I prefer not to do online tests. Online tests tend to be group tests. They, they just are, just a fact of life. So. so that's why I like to do in-person tests. Okay, that's it for today.